Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about continuity. Continuity is a really important example in calculus. Here's the definition of continuity. What continuity is, is if the limit as x approaches a of any function equals the function value at that a value, then we say that function is continuous at that value. Before we move forward, I just want to give you a quick graphical interpretation of what that means. Let's say we have some function here, f of x, and let's, uh, let's give it a hole right here, and let's get some numbers up for fun. Let's say this is an x value of 4 and an output right where this hole is of 2. What you would know so far is that we would say that the limit of this function as x approaches 4 of this function f of x would give us 2. We say the limit is 2 because from the left and the right, as we approach x values near 4, we output values very close to 2. Though this function would not be continuous at x equals 4 because we don't have a defined function value. If we want this function here to be continuous, what we would need to do is actually not have a hole here, but have a point there at x equals 4 giving out a value of 2. Or in other words, we want f of 4 to equal 2. Now that our function's limit at 4 is 2, and the function value is 2, we say this function is continuous at x equals 4. The following six function types are continuous on their domains. What that means, by the way, is that everywhere the function is defined at every x value, it's also continuous. And you will see the ramifications of that real soon. First up, polynomials. Polynomials are continuous on their domain. Radicals are also continuous on their domain. Exponentials. trig functions, rationals, and logarithmic functions. We won't go into the detail of proving these, but just know that we know that all of these function types, where they're defined on their domains, they are continuous. Our next theorem states that if you have two functions that are known to be continuous at a certain x value, and if you consider c a constant, then the following combinations of these functions are also continuous at that x value. For instance, the new function f plus g, that function is continuous at a. f minus g is also continuous. It's also continuous if you multiply f and g by that constant, so c times f and c times g. Those four new functions, again, those are combinations of functions. Those are all continuous at x equals a. Also, if you multiply f and g, the resulting function is continuous at the a value. And if you divide them, it's also continuous. That is given that that g does not output 0 at a. Obviously, we can't divide by 0, so we'll just write that in. So g of a cannot be 0 for that to be continuous at a. We now have our definition of continuity, and we have two very useful theorems. Again, one theorem says that we have a list of Almost all of the function types that we know of are continuous on their domains. And we also know if we add and subtract different types of functions that are continuous at a value, they're also continuous. Let's now see why that's useful to your life. Here is our first example. It is the limit as x approaches power 4 of cosine of x over 5 minus sine of x. Importantly, up until this point, we couldn't use limit laws or even direct substitution to tackle this right here. But we can use an argument based on continuity to easily evaluate this limit. First and foremost, we know that for cosine and sine, their domain is all real numbers. These are periodic functions that go from negative infinity to positive infinity as far as their domains go. They're defined on everyone on the domain, therefore they're continuous everywhere, specifically Cosine and sine are both continuous at pi over 4. 
We can think of the number five as a very simple polynomial, a polynomial of degree zero, the constant polynomial. And we know that polynomials have a domain of all real numbers. Therefore, this is also continuous at pi over four. Then using the other argument we just talked about, that any combination of adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing these continuous functions together results in another continuous function. We then, by continuity, can say that the limit of this function right here is equal to this function being evaluated at pi over four. Or in other words, just using an argument of continuity, we can say that this limit is equal to the cosine of pi over four over five minus sine of pi over four. Again, if you've been working hard on evaluating limits, this is a really big deal and very freeing. We don't have to go through the steps of using limit laws or piecing together direct substitution. With these last two theorems and the concept of continuity, we know that this limit of a continuous function is simply evaluated by plugging in that value of pi over four. Now let's do the fun work of simplifying this as much as possible. The cosine of pi over four we know is root two over two. And then we have five minus the sine of pi over four is also root two over two. I'm gonna clean up my fractions here to multiply both the numerator, numerator and the denominator by two. This will give me uh, the square root of two on top. On the bottom we'll have 10 minus the square root of two. I could be satisfied with that as an answer, but we know generally we don't like to have square roots in the denominator. So let's rationalize this denominator real quick. What I'm going to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. That is 10 plus the square root of two. When I multiply this out, the numerator would be 10 square root of two plus the square root of two times the square root of two is simply just two. And the denominator, when I multiply these together, this is the reason I multiplied by the conjugate, right? This is the difference of squared or multiplication of conjugates. This is gonna give me 10 squared or 100 minus the square root of two squared, which is two. Simplifying a little bit further, it gives me 10 root two plus two over 98. And the last thing I'm going to do, it looks like I can cancel a factor two between the numerator and the denominator to give me five square root of two plus one over 49. Again, the focus of this problem was the ability to attack this limit quickly using an argument of continuity. All of the rest of this, well, that was just the fun of doing some algebra. All right, we know that a function can be continuous on a point. We also talk about a function being continuous on an interval. We say that a function is continuous on an interval if it's continuous at every point on that interval. There's an important caveat here is that endpoints can be one-sided continuous. What we mean by one-sided continuity is the fact that we only need this limit to be true or to be um, defined on one side. Our function f here is the piecewise function which defined between negative one and one as one over x. This includes one and negative one importantly. After one, we're the linear function three x plus one. Before negative one, our function is negative x squared. If we look at here, we now have a graphical representation which is not too hard to produce. If you see this, on the left-hand side of negative one, we have this parabola, this x squared. Between negative one and one, we have the function one over x. Importantly, we have these dots here that indicate what's going on here at negative one and one. It's defined with this function. And then after one, we have the linear function three x plus one. Given a graphical argument, knowing the concept of limits and function values, we can argue the intervals of continuity of this function right here. As we can see from negative infinity up to zero, our function, if you look at every single place, we have a nice smooth function where the limit is exactly the same 
as the function value. There is an issue it looks like at negative one, but if you look at x equals negative one, which is where these two functions meet right here, they both meet at an output value of negative one. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right also meets the function value. So we would say that this function on the interval negative infinity up to zero is continuous. We can't include zero, importantly, because this function is not defined at zero. Once we move past zero, we see this little bit right here of one over x. Our function is continuous then from zero or greater than zero up to one. This is an important point now with these endpoints right here. Because at one, our function is defined, and if you look at the left-hand sided limit, our function goes to one, we would also say that our function is continuous from zero to one, including one, because the limit and the function value agree at one, but zero is not included in that interval because our function is not defined at zero. Finally, we would say our function is continuous from one to infinity, not including one again, because our function value is not defined on that interval there, um, but up to infinity. Another way that we could have gone around arguing these continuities without a graphical representation would have been first to realize that each of these functions fall within those groups of functions that are continuous on their domains. So we know one over x, three x plus one, and negative x squared are all continuous on their domain. The only issues would be are where these piecewise domains where they meet with each other, right? We would check what's happening at negative one. What we would know at negative one, if for instance, for this uh, interval right here, is that x equals negative one. This function has an output value of negative one, so the limit goes to negative one. This function also outputs negative one at x equals negative one, so the limit goes to that, and the function value is negative one. Because those two-sided limits and the function value all agree, we've satisfied continuity at x equals negative one. One last thing to emphasize that's really important is this statement right here, is that this interval in the middle was continuous up to one, including one, because the one-sided or the left-hand side limit and the function value agreed. When you talk about an interval specifically, one-sided limit continuity is just fine. Just to be sure that we know how to attack these kind of problems without looking at graphical representations, I want to answer this question right here for this piecewise function. Is this function f continuous at x equals one? This function is a rational function everywhere except at x equals one. At x equals one, this function is just defined as one. Again, when we're checking continuity, I wanna emphasize that there's three things to check. First, does the limit exist? For that to be true, the limit has to exist. Is the function defined at that value? That, for this to be true, your function has to be defined. And then three, which should be clearly obvious, are the limit and the function value equal to each other? So the things that we're gonna check are first, I'm gonna do the easiest one. What is f of one? Well, that's easy and defined very clearly in this function. This function is one at x equals one. Now the question becomes, is the limit defined at x equals one? And if it is, is it equal to one? So let's do the work now of evaluating the limit of this function at x equals one. I can use the equivalent function theorem to replace f of x with this function x squared minus x over x minus one, or x squared minus one, excuse me. Again, this function and this function are the same everywhere except that x equals one. So I can make that replacement because we're evaluating our limit at x equals one. I'm now going to factor the numerator and the denominator. Here I factor out an x to get x times x minus one. In the denominator here, this is a difference of squares, x minus one times x plus one. We have this common factor of x minus one giving us the limit as x approaches one of x over x plus one. And again, the reason I didn't just use a continuous argument or, or direct substitution was because if I would have plugged in a one here, I would have got zero in my denominator. 
I don't have that issue anymore. I can directly now substitute a one in for the x here and evaluate, giving me one over one plus one, which is one half. What we've now found is that the function is defined at one. We have a limit defined at one. The issue here is they're not the same. The function is defined as one. The limit of this function is one half. So the limit as x approaches one of this function is not equal to one. Therefore, f is not continuous or f is discontinuous at x equals one. The last theorem I want to give you for this video is the composition of functions. And this one states that if the function g is continuous at a and the function f is continuous at g of a, in other words, if f is continuous at whatever this function outputs at x equals a, then f composed of g of x, or maybe the easier way of remembering this notation is f of g of x, that function right there is also continuous at x equals a. This theorem is important because this puts a button on the previous one where we added, subtracted, multiply, and divide continuous functions. Now we know that combining two continuous functions in every normal algebraic way that we understand will result in a continuous function as long as we don't develop some type of domain issue. Just to give a quick example of this right here, if we're asked to evaluate this limit as x approaches pi of sine composed of x plus sine of x, the thing here is now within the argument or the input of sine, we have more things going on. Though what we have is a polynomial, a trig function, the addition of a polynomial and a trig function, which we understand to be continuous. So the inner function here, which would be g, is a continuous function. Then the only thing we need to be sure is, is that this outer function sine is also continuous at the output of these at pi. Though sine as a function is continuous and is, is defined for all real numbers, you can input whatever you want want into sign, there are no domain restrictions, so we have satisfied this. Therefore, this limit is equal, out of an argument of continuity, is equal to sine of pi plus the sine of pi. We can just evaluate this. Remember sine, sine is zero at pi, so this will just give us the sine of pi, pi plus zero. This will give us the sine of pi, obviously, which is just zero. Again, one of the beauties of this section, as long as you don't abuse it and you follow the theorems and the rules that you're allowed to, is that we can evaluate difficult limits quickly using an argument of continuity. A function is continuous if its limit at a is equal to the function value at a. We know that the six major types of functions that we know about are continuous on their domain. We know that if we add and subtract and multiply and divide them together or by a constant, we result in a continuous function. Finally, we know that if we compose continuous functions together, we'll get a new continuous function, which makes our lives a whole heck of a lot easier when we're trying to evaluate limits.